Article 2 is adopted. Donald Trump becomes the third president in American history to be impeached. It doesn't really feel like we're being impeached. How might it affect his re-election campaign in 2020? Boeing will shut down production of its 737 MAX, which was involved with two deadly crashes. Could Boeing's decision hurt the U.S. economy? Meanwhile, the number of refugees has risen to more than 25 million worldwide. How to tackle this global crisis? Now on Dialogue Weekend. Welcome to this edition of a Dialogue Weekend. I'm Xu Qinduo. Here with me in the studio are Zun Ahmad Han and Andy Mock. Welcome to both of you. Well, we all know that President Trump will remain in the office despite all the fanfare of impeachment by his Democratic rivals. So why are the Democrats doing that? Is it a waste of time or there is something beyond that? So Andy, we all know it has been going on for some time. President Trump has been impeached, just as he said right now, uh, a minute ago. It doesn't feel I'm impeached. So any, any specific impact on the president, uh, we know he will not be removed from the office. Well, we have to see, and I mean, even this question, how long has impeachment been going on, is, depends who you ask. So, of course, the formal impeachment proceedings have been actually, by historical standards, very, very short. Mm -hmm. But because the U.S. is so polarized that even some basic facts uh, are completely different depending on who you ask. So, according to Trump and his supporters, uh, this impeachment process began even before he was elected. With this <laughs> before 2016. Right. right. Well, with this unholy alliance of the Democrats, the Republican never Trumpers, and the deep state, mm -hmm. who all conspired to kick him out of office by any means possible. So, that's the Trump supporter side. And of course, the Democrats, led by uh, House Speaker Pelosi, mm -hmm. have said this is a president that has violated all kinds of norms, violated even laws about what a president is allowed to do. And therefore, they had no choice but to conduct this formal impeachment hearing. Mm -hmm. But that being said, impeachment is a political process. So I would maybe challenge this a little bit, Ting Duan, and say yes. Uh, as it currently stands, the Senate, given that's controlled by the Republicans, mm -hmm. and it looks like uh, Senator McConnell has is maintaining his iron-fisted grip yeah. on the Republican senators, uh, so that Trump cannot be removed from office. But yet, if we look at the most recent piece from Christianity Today mm -hmm. that called for Trump's removal from office, that could this be a crack in his evangelical base? And if these people abandoned him, I think senators like Mitt Romney, others that have been deeply uncomfortable with President Trump but have gone along because they fear his base and they like what he's done for the Republican Party, especially with judicial appointments. So yes, I think it's com very unlikely he'll be removed from office, but yet we can't turn away <laughs> completely the chances, we right? But then the bigger question, I mean, I would be interested in knowing is what are the implications of the process so far on American society and American politics? Because what we see, I mean, especially if we follow social media and obviously mainstream media sources, there seems to be a lot of conflict. Um, it seems that those in support and those against the impeachment, uh, they have heightened uh, sentiments about this. So can we see the, the, that? There's one survey, interestingly, you know, yeah. like uh, before the impeachment, uh, so those uh, who are for uh, impeachment is no. like 91% or 41% <laughs> after the impeachment, it goes up who are against the impeachment. Who are against, who are against the impeachment, the impeachment uh, yes. So interesting. So maybe the silent majority uh, is awakening. The recent poll, basically, you know, mm -hmm. half and half. Uh, 47, 48 mm -hmm. people, uh, mm -hmm. percent of people are for impeachment, okay. and the exact percentage of people say no to impeachment. So okay. you can see this is a very div div divisive society. Yes, and I think that this is initially, these polls are what encouraged or emboldened uh, House Speaker Pelosi to launch these impeachment mm -hmm. hearings, thinking that the public was with them. Mm -hmm. And as they learned more, there would be this call from uh, the public that Trump mm -hmm. be removed from office, and this looks like that bet hasn't paid off. But Zoom, to go back to your point, I think it's an excellent, excellent point, and a mm -hmm. question you raise is that it's not just about impeachment, but what does this mean for the American political system? Yeah. And in fact, when we look at the next steps 
um, you know, Pelosi's held back on sending the articles to the Senate because, and this is astounding, that uh, Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham essentially have said, we are going to be in complete alignment with the White House. And if you think about this is actually, at least in form, a trial, mm. and the senators are the jurors. So this would just be like if I were accused of stealing a car, and Zoon, you were a juror, you said, I'm going to work with Andy to make sure <laughs> I do whatever he says. You know, that really completely undermines the, pro the, purpose, the purpose of this yeah. process. Right. And I think what this means, though, is that the American political system is under grave, grave threat. Mm -hmm. And this impeachment is really just either a symptom or an outcome of something that is a far deeper problem. Yeah, for, for people who are not familiar or following this story, you know, the House is acting like a prosecutor, mm -hmm. uh, basically uh, you know, building that case against mm -hmm. the president. And uh, the Senate uh, is acting like a juror and a yeah, judge yes. oh. at the same time. Okay. So right now, you know, uh, the Senate is basically waiting for the House to present the case to the senators. Mm -hmm. But the Democrats are holding the case right now. <laughs> they say, oh, they are put, putting forward more conditions. For example, like, uh, okay, uh, Mitch McConnell, mm -hmm. uh, majority leader, you need to call in more witnesses. Mm -hmm. And then the Republican would say, that shows like you have a weak case. <laughs> you have a very thin case against the president. Yes. So we will not go ahead with that. And, and also if you compare this impeachment against the President Trump, uh, for example, the latest one uh, against Bill Clinton yeah. uh, in the 1990s, late 1990s. Mm -hmm. So at that time, if you take a look at the vote, uh, it's mixed. So you see there are Democrats even uh, agreeing with the Republicans against the President yes. uh, Bill Clinton. But now the vote is largely or strictly, strictly party line. Yeah, party mm -hmm. line. Yeah. So that's why people are saying this is not about uh, uh, you know, defending the Constitution. It's, this is a political trial. This is not a legal trial, not a legal matter, but a political issue here. Exactly. And I think this is, again, which you know, from just the pure cut and thrust of domestic politics, I think uh, the Democrats led by Pelosi are now in a pretty tough situation mm -hmm. because they said we have to do this because it's the Constitution, it's upholding rule of law. Mm -hmm. And it certainly looks like now that she's basing this decision on politics. Mm -hmm. So I think this may in fact backfire uh, and end up helping Trump in his re-election bid in 2020. Well, the, the, the issue is like, uh, you know, uh, previously people would say uh, Democrats will benefit probably by impeaching uh, President Trump. But this is a tricky, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I see few people are sure that, you know, Democrats or the Republicans will benefit from the whole process of yeah. impeachment. Mm -hmm. uh, because the issue is tricky. And then President Trump will probably, they will say, oh, I'm not feeling I'm being impeached. And uh, he is basically uh, mustering more support among at least his base, Republican yes. base there. Yeah. And people would say this is a partisan politics. Yeah, so maybe it, could, it, could it be possible that the Democrats lose certain legitimacy? I mean, because this is a party uh, interest yeah. rather than a national interest on which they want to take but this trial against President Trump. So maybe it's risky I, I, for I, them I, as I, well. I think, it depend, again, as uh, Andy said, it depends on who you talk to. For mm -hmm. some Republicans or their supporters, definitely, they would say, from 2016, you know, this is the way to rob the president of his uh, uh, presidency, yeah. legitimacy, right? And not the just the presidency, the 63 million Americans that voted. That voted. <laughs> yeah. that we had a moment of silence for, right? Mm -hmm. like, yes. To respect so, their vote. Yeah, so uh, this is, uh, you see, people are fired up on both mm -hmm. sides mm -hmm. because of the impeachment. But uh, we don't know like, what kind of impact that will have on the 2020 election. Well, this is what makes it so deeply troubling mm -hmm. because there is such polarization and such vehement disagreement on even what the basic facts are. Mm -hmm. So, and in a democracy which depends on the consent of the governed, mm -hmm. we now see you know, this increasingly wide rift mm -hmm between Republicans and Democrats, largely, right? It's uh, you know, people with certain views of Trump with yep. the opposite views of Trump. Well, time will tell uh, <laughs> what kind of uh, outcome or consequence on the Democrats' party or the Republican Party or on mm -hmm. the upcoming 2020 election. Well, let's uh, stay on the U.S. with a focus on a slightly different topic uh, that is uh, specifically uh, about Boeing. The company is uh, suspending its production of the 737 
max jet liner and then adding to that you know heavy blow there's uh, some another high profile failure of the experiment to send a human being to space so Boeing certainly is in big big trouble now and uh, they are trying to let's say it is struggling uh, to regain the confidence uh, the trust from the uh, users customers mm -hmm. but now with the failure of the capsule uh, flying to the international space station uh, not something definitely I mean very negative story for sure. them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No I think Tindor you're right that these are two negative stories but the one I'd like to focus on a little bit more is the 737 MAX mm -hmm. and the reason for that is first of all for Boeing this is such an important product for them so they're in the business of selling airplanes. Yeah. 5,000 Boeing 737's back ordered so this is their biggest product and it's been grounded and it's not clear when it will take to the skies again mm -hmm. so they're hemorrhaging uh, something like a billion dollars a month now that they've stopped production so this is a big financial problem for them but I think what makes this story more interesting than just a business story is that this is also I think a parable for our earlier topic about the challenges the United States is facing because how did Boeing get into this this mess so it's not a software problem I would say it's not even a product design problem because what Boeing did was they took a 737 which is a more than a 50 year old design mm -hmm. and tried to make it fit for the modern world so we could look at it as that's a product problem mm -hmm. I would say it's even deeper than that in that the reason they did this was because they were the monopoly leader for many many years until Airbus came along and Airbus first they laughed at Airbus said how could these Europeans ever have a plan to compete with us and yet after a while they came up with the Air A320 Neo that was more fuel efficient airlines loved it so Boeing in a sense kind of panicked and said we've got to do something something mm -hmm. to compete and fast so they cut corners that shouldn't have been cut and I think the parable here then as we look at you know a country like the United States that was the undisputed leader for quite a while and a little bit like Boeing I think got maybe a little complacent perhaps a little bit arrogant and said everything we do is great we don't have to worry too much now suddenly feeling you know some pressure mm -hmm. and making some decisions that perhaps could be uh, you know not necessarily the best decisions mm -hmm. so I think this is an interesting story that's not just a business story but also a political story mm -hmm. there's also another political piece to this as well is that the FAA the FAA the Federal Aviation yeah. Administration the regulator yeah, has long been seen as the lead aviation regulator globally mm -hmm. and now that they kind of delegated their authority to Boeing and now this has turned out to be quite disastrous for them are they going to be able to gain, regain their uh, authority, credibility, yeah, their credibility yeah. Uh, going forward? And as we should point out too, it was China that first mm -hmm. said, "This, you know, we need to stop. We need to ground these Boeing 30, 737 uh -huh. Maxes yeah. until we understand what's going on." And looking back, you see how wise that decision is, yes. and how correct it is. Mm. And also because of uh, Boeing is such a big company, mm. and of course it's not only the production of this uh, uh, jetliner 737 Max, it's also about its supplier. Of supplier yes. to supplier, it's a network. Yeah. So according to U.S. media, it's like a non-defense airplanes and the parts. Basically, Boeing is is refers to Boeing <laughs> and its network. Yeah. So that's. Uh, uh, according to some calculation, you know, because of these uh, uh, suspension of production, that could affect the U.S. GDP growth for the uh, you know first quarter of next, next year mm -hmm. about uh, half a percentage point yes. over there. Oh. You see, like how significant it is. No, it's a great point, Tingdu. Yeah. So, just a couple of numbers. I mean, mm -hmm. Boeing itself has more than 100,000 employees, about 800 suppliers, mm -hmm. and you're right, it's these big companies like Spirit Aerospace that provides the, the, uh, the fuselages mm -hmm. to Boeing yeah. down to three or four person shops that are producing components mm -hmm. and when you think about stopping production well Boeing of course has the cash to survive you know at least maybe say six months a year 
doing this. Some of their suppliers may actually be put out of business, and this could have a tremendous negative impact on the U.S. economy. Yeah. Yeah. But, but anyway, for any transportation vehicle, we yeah. know as a customer, I mean, safety is the most safety important the feature, most right? And that's, that's why it was surprising that when the two airplane crashes happened, there was no response from Boeing. I mean, we were all suspicious that maybe the pilots were not fully trained. Right. Perhaps uh, the maintenance, uh, there was a problem with the mm -hmm. maintenance. And then much later, I mean, I was reading some reports that they knew that at least one or two air crashes were, meant, were bound to happen because of the flaws that their own people had detected. So I guess it's also a big question of responsibility. Like and, who and also the attitudes, right? The How attitude. How to deal with the problem? Uh, and I mean, I would, uh, one would uh, try to understand, like, who are they answerable to? The, the people? I mean, how important is human life for mm -hmm. a company like Boeing? Or is it more about their shareholders and, and their business strategy as a whole? So no, and I think that's a great point, Zun. And this goes back to, I think, some of the systemic features that cause this because part of the problem is Boeing as a publicly listed company feels a lot of pressure to keep up with Airbus. So you know, people talk about how great the capitalist system is and yet it can produce these pressures on companies to cut corners where they where corners should not be cut. Yeah. And you know you're right that you know Boeing's messaging has been first of all well these pilots were not well trained yeah. uh, well it was a software problem mm -hmm. but I think more and more we're seeing the problems are much much deeper mm -hmm. and that it's going to get worse before it gets worse for Boeing and in the sense that there may even be criminal uh, mm -hmm. indictments coming out of this right well uh, Boeing uh, will resume production sometime in the future, but we yeah. don't know when. Uh, jumping to a different topic, uh, for the first time in history, we have a, this uh, global forum on refugee, finally putting the issue under the spotlight. And so what has been discussed and what has been achieved? Are we better armed to deal with this uh, growing crisis? Uh, obviously, as long as people's attention are on the issue, I would say that's positive. No, for sure. I mean, I think, Shindo, we were also initially discussing that the refugee crisis is something that needs to be addressed and understood in a much deeper and broader level. Um, recently, we saw that in the European Union, there was a lot of debate and discussion about how these refugees are coming. And in some senses, I mean, there was a, dis a disagreement between member countries how to accept them. But the bigger conversation to have is, what are the basic rights of refugees? Mm -hmm. How are they suffering in these communities? And if we look at this, uh, this uh, special initiative taken by a lot of the developing countries that are taking in the most refugees in the world today, then the conversation is more about how can we uh, provide safety measures? How can the world as a whole uh, unite and understand that this is not a responsibility for countries like Greece and Spain, for example, or Turkey and Pakistan, for example, that become recipients of the most refugees? but the globe as a whole. That's a good point. I think yeah. that not everybody is familiar with that, probably the situation you mentioned about developing countries. About for developing example, Turkey, countries. for example, yeah. Jordan. Jordan. <laughs> they are probably hosting the much, many, many more number of refugees than the European countries. 84% of the refugees are but, in developing countries. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, somehow the attention uh, you know, has been uh, almost all on the you know, European countries versus the refugee uh, yeah. crisis over there. And of course, with this uh, a global uh, forum on mm -hmm. refugee hosted by the UN together with a few developing countries over there. Mm -hmm. uh, now at least I think uh, there's a, a clear commitment or required commitment from developed countries yeah. what they can do to contribute to the resolution of this problem. Uh, but at the same time of course you know, people talking about uh, this uh, representation of a refugee or yes. people with some experience of mm -hmm. being a refugee only 2% of them, yeah. of this like 7,000 people, mm. uh, you know, they were uh, there present. Yeah, were there present. Yeah. So it's but we're talking about 70 million refugees, and, yeah. and more than 50% of refugees are below 18 years of age. So we're talking about massive ge a, a generation mm -hmm. of young children young population that yes. should be invested in right. and and the bigger problem is I mean I'll go back to uh, maybe mechanisms such as the Shanghai Corporation a mechanism uh, a corporation organization mechanism that mm -hmm. talks about engaging the youth and understanding where they're susceptible so when we talk about refugee populations where they're neglected they don't have basic health 
education facilities, then they definitely become more susceptible to radicalization as well. So in that sense, it's a global responsibility. And um, what's specifically interesting in this, um, uh, in this initiative is that a lot of sports, uh, a lot of sports uh, communities were also represented. They said that, well, sports can be a good way to integrate, integrate refugees in their in new communities mm -hmm. and for them to, uh, you know, become part of the daily course it, it, rather than being marginalized and uh, being yeah. further victimized. Right. But, but, you know, for me, I think, you know, uh, it's not enough if we want to tackle this issue mm -hmm. from the root causes, for example. Uh, you know, I'm from China. I would yeah. say, I would argue, uh, let's focus on development. Let's focus on stability. Let's not uh, create a uh, crisis after crisis in different countries or regime change, to engineer regime change like in, uh, in Syria, Syria. Yeah. in Libya, in Iraq, or yeah. in Venezuela. It uh, makes Afghanistan? things worse. Yeah. Yeah. If we, the whole uh, global community will focus on stability and mm. development, you create more opportunities for young people, for the families, and they would, of course, stay where they are. They would not risk their lives crossing this ocean dangerous ocean to reach the other shore of the Absolutely. Yeah. No, and I think this is where Imran Khan in his speech at mm -hmm. the forum made a great point that yeah. prevention should be the first objective. Yes. And, you know, where does prevention start? It's by strong governance, right? And that means providing stability, providing safety, providing nutrition, mm -hmm. providing jobs, and jobs yeah, yeah. yeah. And economic, uh, the hope of a yeah. better economic future. Mm -hmm. and yeah. That really is the true definition of human rights, that yeah. if a country can do that, then mm -hmm. that really is in its own interest as well as I think, helping yeah. alleviate this refugee so it's problem. It's a great point in the terms of a human rights definition. I know people have different ideas, but mm -hmm. for people from developing countries, uh, you know, have your children well fed, well clothed. Yeah. That's a fundamental and physically human safe. right. And, and physically safe. And, and yeah, yeah, free from yeah. fear, from, uh, free from insecurity and have jobs. Have jobs. Yeah. Mm. And I think, I mean, China's rise, the way that uh, even the Belt and Road Initiative talks about addressing some root causes of instability and talks about economic opportunities, socio-economic development, it is deeply linked with the problems such as the refugee crisis that we're facing globally. And I feel very happy that it was th the global south, developing countries, countries that have faced this crisis for years and haven't been that vocal about it. The world doesn't know the extent to which Pakistan or Turkey or Jordan right. are facing uh, this crisis. The burden, yeah. The burden. And especially given that they're struggling economically themselves as well. Pakistan, for example, we have a lot of economic challenges and millions of refugees on top of that to, to absorb. That's, that's a good point. I mean, if uh, we know there's a CPAC, this big project yeah. between China and Pakistan, basically focusing on investment in infrastructure, yes. factories, uh, plants to produce power, Electricity. produce Electricity. energy, jobs mm. for the young people. Mm. I mean, let's see, uh, let's say uh, it, it's successful one day. Mm. It takes time, right, to build yeah. all those projects. Mm. Uh, it will, uh, you know, be creating a lot of jobs for young Already people. Already 100,000 jobs have yeah, been created and we expect Enough that to increase. Enough power for people to consume and manufacturing. Yeah. Yeah, and then I mean, when the economy is stabilized, it's growing. Mm. Uh, you create some more opportunities and young people will stay where they are. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that will help reduce a great deal the number of refugees, right? Of course. Yeah, on one hand, we need to deal with the current issue. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we really need to, uh, to somehow to, to cut I mean, the, the continued production of, of refugees. For sure. Yeah. And I think this is this, the fact that we can have this conversation openly uh, and understand that there is an impact of certain policies, certain foreign, policy, foreign interventions yes. that have happened in the previous decade, and the impact is, uh, is something that we are all facing. The well, that being for. said, I think that just briefly I want to say that, but this problem of refugees mm. has been as old as mankind. Exactly. So, I mean, natural disasters, floods, droughts, etc., et sort of also mm. cause refugees. But I think you know what we really should pay more attention to is how do we reduce man-made causes yes. of refugees, yes. whether that's I mean, or poor governance. To, yeah, yeah, to eradicate this issue, is this issue completely maybe wishful thinking, but at least we can minimize uh, this problem. Well, with yeah. that, let's uh, leave it there and uh, take a look at uh, this week's uh, newsmaker. Well, 
Zun, you are from Pakistan. Yes. You know, people naturally would ask you this what question. What happened? You know, yeah, what happened? And also for me, I, I'm, I'm shocked to see I mean, this, how harsh this uh, sense uh, is. Uh, death penalty. Uh, you know, yes, I understand that there will be some charges, some of verdicts, some mm -hmm. kind of sentencing. But this harsh to a formal general and a formal head of the country, head right? Of the country. That's surprising. Uh, I think it was surprising for the world and I think for Pakistanis as well. Um, of course, I mean, we saw that the verdict in itself is very harsh. Mm -hmm. uh, general Musharraf right now is in Dubai. He is recovering. He is very unwell and he wasn't there to represent himself. And there are voices within Pakistan pointing out that was this even a fair trial? And uh, I think as we mentioned in the newspaper, I mean, is it personal vendetta or not? But I think the, the, the important thing to understand is that in Pakistan, uh, that decade when President Musharraf was leading the country, it was a difficult decade for sure. 9-11 mm -hmm. happened. Uh, we That's had right. proliferation of, uh, of external elements that caused instability, security issues. And because of that, I mean, the, the, the amount of uh, whatever General Musharraf contributed as, uh, as in that leadership position, it had goods and bads both. And of course, uh, I see that predominantly Pakistanis, uh, the PTI, for example, uh, the army also, they gave out a statement, of course, he served the country for 40 years, and he made immense sacrifices for the country as well. Uh, it's that, well, this, this sentence, this judgment is not appropriate. Um, however, I mean, there are people in civil society that are saying, well, you know, what, what was the purpose of passing the sentence? And maybe it was to say that no more, you know, now we... Keeps yeah, it seems, seems to be that uh, because mm. we know uh, Musharraf will not be back uh, from uh, <laughs> no. uh, you know, going back to this country to face the sentence, obviously. So it's more symbolic, let's say. Mm. Uh, no, he will not be uh, you know, like, like an uh, executive over there. But, but then, if this is a message, this is a message obviously to the military, to the government. Well, the military has been such an important institution in Pakistan. Yes. Uh, basically, half of the 70 years of this uh, republic's history um, uh, being under control of the military for stability, crisis time, you know, it's all military. Mm -hmm. But so, um, you know, it's really about how that will impact the relationship between the judiciary organs, the military, the government over there. No, and I think no. that's a great point, right? I mean, we were discussing this uh, in the sh before the show that, you know, how much of this is a clash between institutions mm -hmm. versus a clash between political factions, and of course it's both. But I do agree that you know, I think one of the th things that makes uh, Pakistan special mm -hmm. is the role that the military has played. You know, like some other countries uh, in Latin America, that the military has been an important role. Thailand yeah. also. Yeah. So how this plays out, I think, really does matter and is worth, it's more than just this one particular verdict. It's also that, I mean, now we see, for example, for the first time in Pakistan's history, we have a third politically elected government uh, in power. So I think um, before the conversation, maybe 10 years ago, of like the military's role it, of being in the seat of power, I mean, it's less so relevant, less relevant now. And uh, we see that Pakistanis have been politicized in a certain way. Um, the military and the current uh, elected government are compatible with one another, and this is fine. This, uh, there is yeah. a. Uh, the interests are aligned and right. there doesn't need to be this uh, prov this maybe came as a provocation unexpected so uh, uh, people reacted to it for sure right. but predominantly but Pakistanis seem to be uh, shocked by the, the verdict. I mean, people uh, seems to me like uh, from the Chinese language media uh, mm -hmm. you know like uh, people would say hey uh, you know for whatever reasons uh, different elements of different parties uh, the tolerance, a certain degree of restraint should be Respect exercised as well. uh, yeah, and to build a nation of united, yeah. united nation. Well, um, and with that, we are coming to the end of today's show. You can watch us on the CGTN app or on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. You can follow me uh, on Twitter, Xu Qinduo. Thank you for watching. See you next week. <laughs>